All right, everybody. So this is chapter 16, and it's going to be an abbreviated version of the chapter. I've kind of left the things out of the PowerPoint that I'm not going to be testing you on. So it's got two major areas. The autonomic nervous system is the first, and then higher order brain functions is the second. So I'm probably going to split this into two videos, and this one will just cover the autonomic nervous system. Okay. So, focus of this chapter, again, autonomic nervous system, and anytime you hear the word autonomic, I want you to do a little brain substitution, and I want you to substitute the word automatic, because the autonomic nervous system handles everything in your body that happens automatically, things that you don't have to make a decision about. So, all of your organs and how they function are going to be controlled by the autonomic system. Then the second half of this chapter kind of goes back to the brain chapter because although we learned the nitty gritty parts of the brain in anatomy one, we really didn't concentrate on the brain working as a whole. And so these bigger areas of brain function are called higher order functions and it has to do with things like your consciousness, like how awake you are, your concept of learning and intelligence. Okay, so let's get going. So. We've already been working on this huge outline from way back in chapter 12 of this textbook, building this giant outline of the nervous system and how it works. So we split it first into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, and of course central we learned the brain and the spinal cord. In the peripheral nervous system, which is going to have divisions, right? We're going to have the sensory division. That's going to be bringing in all of our incoming information from sensory receptors. And then we had the efferent or motor division. Now the motor division can be split again, and it's split into the somatic and autonomic. Somatic nervous system is for your voluntary control of skeletal muscles. Autonomic system, like I just said, handles everything that is going to be involuntary. So this includes all of your smooth muscles, your cardiac muscle, your glands, and even, we're going to find out, our adipocytes, our fat cells, respond to motor commands and release things. So a very important brain area that's going to control the interface between the autonomic nervous system and the central nervous system is the hypothalamus. It's going to be key. I've described the hypothalamus as the little guy driving the mech suit. It's a very, very important brain region. And so there are going to be neurons from the hypothalamus that are going to be close to your upper motor neurons in your somatic system that are going to be communicating from the hypothalamus out to the autonomic nervous system. And the motor neurons of the central nervous system, we're going to synapse on visceral motor neurons, and they're going to synapse in clusters of nerve cell bodies that are outside of the spinal cord. So they're going to be called ganglia. And since they're for the autonomic system, we're going to call them autonomic ganglia. Okay, so since we're talking about having several neurons, we have to kind of have a way to name them. So we're going to have one neuron that's going to start in the brainstem or the spinal cord, and it's going to leave and it's going to go out to the ganglion. So since it happens before the ganglion, guess what we're going to call it? the preganglionic neuron. And the axon of that preganglionic neuron is going to be called the preganglionic fiber. Okay, then we get to the autonomic ganglia. We're going to talk about different kinds of ganglia and where they're located. And so the second neuron has its cell body in that ganglion. And so its axon is going to leave. So that neuron is going to be called the postganglionic neuron. And its axon will be called the postganglionic fiber. Now, hopefully, I haven't already started sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher. You know, that voice that goes wah, 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 wah. I know, it's a lot of words. But just break it down, and you'll be able to follow along. Okay, so here's an example. This is the somatic nervous system. So this is voluntary skeletal muscle. And we know that all voluntary muscle movements come from this one wrinkle of the brain, the precentral gyrus. So we have two examples. We have the neuron cell body here, and its axon is actually going to go all the way down, probably be in the pyramid. And then it's going to come and synapse here in the somatic nuclei of the spinal cord. And then the second neuron leaves the spinal cord from the anterior gray horn, and its axon goes out and becomes the spinal nerve and goes out to the spinal uh, skeletal muscle. OK, 
okay? So it's a two neuron system, upper and lower motor neurons. We can do the same thing just going as far as the brain stem. So we have one that leaves from this part of the precentral gyrus and goes through the brain stem and synapses in a nucleus there. And then the second neuron, the lower motor neuron, goes out to a skeletal muscle like in the face or the throat or the neck. All right, so this is what we're used to. For the autonomic system, it gets a little more complicated. So our first nucleus, our first uh, group of neuron cell bodies is going to be in the hypothalamus. And so my first neuron has its body there, and then it's going to have its axon that comes down the spinal cord, and it's going to go to an autonomic nucleus, which is going to come off a lateral gray horn. Okay, so this is my first neuron. Then I have one that leaves the spinal cord, but it hasn't gotten to the ganglion yet. So this one will be my preganglionic neuron. And then it synapses with the second neuron here in the ganglion. So this is actually technically the third neuron in the ganglion. So this is the ganglionic neuron or postganglionic neuron. And then this axon would be the postganglionic fiber. And again, we can also do this through the brain stem, okay, or the spinal cord. So for the autonomic system, it takes three neurons to get out to the organ, unlike the skeletal muscle system that only takes two. So we can take our autonomic system and we can divide it again in half. And we have two divisions of the autonomic system. One is called the sympathetic division and the other one is the parasympathetic. Now the sympathetic division happens right in the middle of the thoracic and lumbar parts of the spinal cord. And it controls what we call your fight or flight response. It is only for dealing with emergencies. And so the things that your body does when it prepares for an emergency are gonna be due to sympathetic uh, nervous system stimulation. So things like increase your heart rate, increase your alertness, increase your breathing, get more blood pumping to your muscles, okay? So all of those are gonna be controlled by the sympathetic division. Parasympathetic, the prefix para, P-A-R-A, -A, means around, and this is at the top and bottom of the spinal cord. So it's gonna be up in the cervical region and brainstem region, and then way down in the sacral region, and it controls the parts of your body that uh, runs them in the rest and digest mode. So when you're not having an emergency, well, when you're not having an emergency, what normally happens is you have slow breathing, a lower heart rate, lower blood pressure, and you're concentrating on body functions like digesting food and filtering blood to create urine. So those are gonna be things that are gonna be run primarily through the parasympathetic division. Now, all of, almost all of your organs have both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves going to them. So rather than being um, only controlled by one or only controlled by the other, we say that they're duly innervated. So while the sympathetic system is running, let's say your heart, that it makes your heart go faster and pump harder. When the parasympathetic is controlling it, it will pump less. It will be a less forceful contraction and a slower heart rate. So usually parasympathetic and sympathetic systems will work on the same organ, but they'll have opposite effects. There are some cases in our bodies where we only have one of them. Okay, so they may also work independently. And then they may also work together, actually accomplishing the same goal. They may each take over a few steps, getting us towards the same goal. So if we were to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, so we will be increasing sympathetic activity. These are the types of things we would expect to see. Heightened mental alertness. You might say your spidey senses start tingling. Increased metabolic rate. And we're going to shut down digestion and urinary functions because we don't want to bother the body for digesting food if we're in an emergency. We want to channel all of our energy into fight or flight. We're going to activate alternate energy reserves. We're gonna increase respiratory rate and dilation of passageways. We're gonna increase heart rate and blood pressure and activate the sweat glands. So you can imagine all of this happens when you get frightened or you're really revved up about an emergency. If we were to increase parasympathetic activity, 
we would notice decreased metabolic rate, decreased heart rate and blood pressure. We would have increased secretion by your salivary glands. Your mouth waters when you're on rest and digest. It gets dry in an emergency. And your digestive glands, we're now going to turn on digestion if we increase parasympathetic activity. We're going to have increased motility in the digestive tract and increased blood flow to the digestive tract. And eventually we're going to stimulate urination and defecation only under parasympathetic control. So let's concentrate on the sympathetic division again. It's also called the thoracolumbar division because, again, it's in the middle of the spinal cord. Now, what you may have remembered from earlier and from lab exercises that we had these little clusters of ganglia along the sides of the spinal cord in the thoracic region, and they were called the sympathetic chain ganglia. That is because that is where we're going to have the ganglia for the organs that are going to be having um, the connection with the sympathetic system. So the first neuron is going to only go from the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord out the spinal nerve over to the sympathetic chain. And then it's going to synapse. So it's going to have a preganglionic neuron that has an axon that's really short. So the preganglionic neurons are between segments T1, thoracic 1, and L2. Their cell bodies are in the lateral gray horn, and their axons are going to enter, excuse me, they're going to be part of the anterior roots. They're going to come out the front of the spinal cord as the anterior roots. And then they're going to go join the spinal nerve, and then they're immediately going to come across the rami communicantes, and they're going to, going to have ganglionic neurons that are very, very close to, but outside of the spinal cord. Now, the organs that these are gonna to go to are all of your regular organs, heart, lungs, eyes, salivary glands. So the organs, after the second neuron begins in the ganglion, its axon has to go all the way out to each individual organ. So it's going to have a very long postganglionic fiber. The preganglionic fibers are short for the sympathetic division, and the postganglionic fibers are long. So here is a diagram, and I want you to notice something that this chain does. So here's my sympathetic chain ganglia, okay? And notice that the ganglia chains go beyond the actual regions of the spinal cord that we have these nerves coming off of. Also, notice how many places there are entanglements or plexuses in these pathways. So if I were to send an action potential, and I, let's say I chose to come out T3, I could hit this chain, I could go up or down the chain and continue that axon all the way up till it synapses here or here or here. I can send that action potential to all of these organs using any path I choose. So I kind of think of the sympathetic system as the emergency broadcast system. If you are in an emergency, you want all of your organ systems to know and to respond simultaneously. So the way this is set up, we have long postganglionic fibers, but there are so many possible pathways to get to the organs. If you switch over to sympathetic stimulation, every organ that is able to respond to the sympathetic nervous system will do so. We can't choose, oh, I want my eye to respond, but I don't want my bladder. Okay, every single one of these organs is going to get the emergency order and it's going to shift its activity based on what it does in the fight or flight response. Okay, so those sympathetic chain ganglia go up and down the vertebral column. They go a little bit past the, the thoracic and lumbar regions. One preganglionic fiber synapses to many ganglionic neurons. So that's why I said we can send the action potential through many alternate routes. Fibers interconnect the sympathetic chain ganglia, making it look like a string of pearls. And each ganglion is assigned to go to a particular body organ or group of organs. Although, like I just showed you, you can use alternate pathways to get to every organ. So we actually have more ganglia than just the sympathetic chain ganglia for the sympathetic nervous system. They're the major ones. But then we also have some in our abdomen called collateral ganglia. And we have specific ganglia in the center of the adrenal glands in the part of the adrenal gland known as the adrenal medulla. 
So again, the sympathetic chain ones are kind of the most popular, well-studied ones. They run down both sides of the vertebral column, and what they're going to control are things that are in the body wall, like the muscles of the abdomen, the thoracic cavity, things in the head, in the neck, and in the limbs. So this is what, what they look like. So here's a cross section through the spinal cord. And we see this swelling. This is my dorsal root ganglion. So this is the back of the spinal cord, right? This is the sensory information. So here is the front. Here is my lateral gray horn, which is the, where the autonomic neuron cell bodies are. Here is that first preganglionic neuron cell body. Its axon comes out the anterior root. It joins the spinal nerve. And then it's going to come across the ramus communicantes and get to the sympathetic chain, which is represented by this. Now it's going to synapse here, and this is my postganglionic neuron, and it's going to go out to the organ. Okay, so this is how the sympathetic chain works. It's on both sides. It's going to go out to effectors that are going to join the spinal nerves. And we have the white ramus communicans and the gray ramus communicans. Now, how can I explain these two? If you've ever driven on an interstate, and I hope at your age that you have, you know that you have on-ramps and off-ramps. So in this case, the sympathetic chain is the highway, and the two, what we called in Anatomy 1, Ramy communicantes, well, it's plural because there's two individual ones. There's a white ramus and a gray ramus. Notice this one is showing you the white ramus. It is the on-ramp onto the sympathetic chain. So follow this axon. We're coming off the spinal cord. We're in the anterior root. We join the spinal nerve, and then we take this on-ramp, the white ramus, and that gets us from the spinal nerve over to the sympathetic chain. Okay? And now, once I'm on this chain, I can actually travel up and down, just like you could travel on Interstate 37, and I could either just get immediately off, which is what happened in this example. The second neuron was in this ganglion. And then we're going to go back to the spinal nerve by the gray ramus. It's the off-ramp off the highway. Now, this doesn't seem very productive. Just like if you got on the on-ramp to get on 37 and you never even merged, you just went right off the off-ramp and then got back off on the road you were on. Okay? So gray ramus, off-ramp, white ramus on ramp. Usually, now this second neuron, its axon is going to go in the spinal nerve all the way out to the organ, and it's going to tell the organ what to do. Collateral ganglia, there used to be two inside your abdomen, and they merge into one. So they're called collateral. They handle things in the abdominal cavity. It's going to be controlling the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay, so the first neuron leaves the lateral horn, it comes out the ventral root, it joins the spinal nerve, goes on the white ramus, goes through the ganglion without synapsing, and goes all the way out to the collateral ganglion, and then it synapses with the postganglionic neuron. And that second one leaves the collateral ganglion and goes out to the organ. The third and final kind of sympathetic ganglia are located deep inside each of your adrenal glands. Now, the center of the adrenal gland is called the adrenal medulla. And the reason why it's called the adrenal gland is because it secretes adrenaline. Adrenaline is released whenever you're in fight or flight mode. So that is where we're going to have our secretion of adrenaline coming from. So... These neurons start in the lateral gray horn, come out the anterior root, join the spinal nerve, go on the white ramus, pass through this chain ganglion without synapsing, and then go out all the way to the adrenal medulla. And then it synapses with a second neuron, and it's the second neuron that tells the cells of the adrenal medulla to release adrenaline into the bloodstream. So in general, okay, not including the collateral or the adrenal medulla fibers, in general, in the sympathetic division, preganglionic fibers are short and the ganglia are close to the spinal cord, not close to the organ. So because the ganglia are close to the spinal cord, the postganglionic fibers have to be long because they have to get from the ganglion all the way out to the organ. Okay. 
This is again Josh talking about the white ramus and the gray ramus. The white ramus again is the on ramp onto the sympathetic chain, and the gray ramus is the off ramp. Preganglionic fibers will innervate cervical, inferior lumbar, and sacral sympathetic chain ganglia. Chain ganglia provide postganglionic fibers through the gray rami to the cervical, lumbar, and sacral spinal nerves. Okay, so I'm not really going to talk much about the sympathetic nerves. Okay, all right, so here's our picture again. So imagine you're in an emergency, your brain sends down action potentials. They can get to all of your organs through these pathways. And for the eye, of course, it's going to dilate your pupil. Your salivary glands are going to go dry. Your heart's going to increase its rate. Lungs are going to increase your respiratory rate. Your digestive system gets shut off. Urination gets shut off. Okay, all of that happens in an emergency. I also want you to notice that when these several different branches come together, we make what are called the splanchnic nerves. So we merge nervous pathways and then we allow them to branch again. And so we're, these words are gonna become much more important as we go on regions like celiac and superior mesenteric. I'm not going to ask you specifically about these on this first test, but just kind of get familiar with where these are going. Okay, again, the collateral ganglia, this is what is going to give rise to the splanchnic nerves. They're going to be going to organs within the abdominal wall, inside the abdominal cavity. And the adrenal medulla, Modified sympathetic ganglion is going to secrete epinephrine, which is also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine, which is known as noradrenaline. Actually, epinephrine is 75 to 80% of what comes out of the adrenal medulla. And this is a neurotransmitter. We're going to learn a lot about this working kind of as a neurotransmitter and as a neurohormone. It changes the metabolic activities of cells. And it stays in your bloodstream much longer than a direct electrical impulse. So even after the emergency ends, you realize that you're, you're kind of hyped up for a while. Some people call that the adrenaline high. Um, that's due to the fact that this stays in your bloodstream and activates your body much longer than just turning on and off your nervous system would. So sympathetic act the sympathetic division can change the activities of particular effectors. Activation occurs during a crisis. The entire division responds. You can't pick and choose. It's controlled by centers in the hypothalamus, and it affects all your peripheral tissues and central nervous system activity. So fight or flight, things like exercise, excitement, embarrassment, and emergency. And excitement, I mean sex, okay? So the E's are the sympathetic division. Emergency, exercise, excitement, and embarrassment. All of those will trigger the sympathetic response. So things that you would see, increased alertness, feelings of energy and euphoria, increase in blood pressure, heart rate, breathing rate, and depth of respiration and con contractive force of the heartbeat, elevated muscle tone, and mobilization of energy reserves. Now, some things that we're not telling you happen with sympathetic division in this chapter is we shut off your immune system. We'll talk about that when we get to the endocrine system. Most of your sympathetic ganglionic neurons are going to release norepinephrine. Now, norepinephrine, remember, is also called noradrenaline. And so we call these neurons that release noradrenaline adrenergic see adrenaline in there adrenergic neurons other ones will release acetylcholine you remember that old friend and so any of the ones that release acetylcholine are not adrenergic neurons they are cholinergic see choline cholinergic neurons and where we have these are body wall skin brain and skeletal muscles so when they are activated by the sympathetic system these cholinergic neurons release acetylcholine and again effects of sympathetic stimulation are from the interactions of norepinephrine and epinephrine with adrenergic membrane receptors we have alphas and betas norepinephrine stimulates alphas more than it does betas. 
Epinephrine stimulates both, and they're both G-protein coupled receptors. So you may have heard of people who have high blood pressure taking a drug called a beta blocker. That is going to be blocking sympathetic stimulation through beta receptors. And so they cannot be excited by the fight or flight response and have their blood pressure raised. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense to you. Okay, I'm going to stop this one and then we'll pick up with the parasympathetic nervous system in the next video.